All right, everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from around the world. So I presume everybody can hear me this time because you couldn't last time and I just <laughs> carried on. Is that good? Excellent. You're Great all good. Stuff. Carry on. Great stuff. Great stuff. Well, I'm going to dive straight in with a Bible verse or two um, before we introduce everybody and carry on, because this will introduce the topic that we're dealing with this evening. We're reading from the book of Genesis. We're reading from chapter five, starting at verse one. <laughs> This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own image, uh, in his own likeness, after his own image, and named him Seth. Now, one thing you'll know if you've spent any time watching us at Creation Research, when it comes to the biblical side of things, we love to show you God's salvation plan woven throughout history. Um, just watch our Christmas programs or tune in in a couple of weeks when we're doing our Easter programs. I mean, John and myself have been discussing uh, Easter sermons and stuff over the last week, and it's amazing when you look at how brilliantly and intricately God has woven this salvation plan throughout history. So to get our second perspective out of scripture, uh, we're going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're reading in verse 18. But we all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of of the Lord. Now, these two Bible verses are really giving us the theme that we're talking about today because we're talking about humans. Human beings, I and mean, in particular, we're looking at ape men, human evolution. We're looking at theistic evolution. We're looking at can you fit these evolutionary ideas into the Bible? And we're also looking at that important question of just how different are humans from apes? Are humans from animals. Oh, because when you open up your evolution textbook, it goes on and on and on about all the similarities, but we're specifically interested today about the differences. So that's what we're going to be discussing today. We're, of course, joined by John, we're joined by Dr. Diane, and we're joined by Sam Jenkins, who I believe has a new laptop. I do indeed. It is a very major blessing. So thank you to everyone who could help make this happen. Um, so yeah, we're gonna. That, this means the Genesis project is still on. It's all good. Nothing's Great lost. Stuff. It's all good. Um, I, I will. Stuff. I will say before we carry on. I got a little bit worried when you were reading um, that verse from Genesis because I thought you were going to go through all of the genealogies for <laughs> quite some time. I stopped um, in time, indeed. Yeah, you stopped in time, which is good. <laughs> That's good stuff. Yes. And uh, John, um, how's it how's it going over there? By, by the way, John, I'll let you I'll let you know, because um, obviously everybody knows it's April Fool's today. Right. And I was uh, I'm, I'm a member of several Facebook groups to do with zookeeping because of my background as a zookeeper. Right. And I opened it up today and it said um, they've decided to <laughs> they've decided to release uh, 300 kangaroos into the wilds of Wyoming to give hunters a new opportunity so I thought, and everybody was going off about how a terrible idea this was and well yeah, and all this kind of stuff and conservation or not so i uh one or two people did get the uh, fact that it was april fools anyway so but anyway how's it going over in australia well uh you just remind me that in the back of my car i have a big bag of kangaroo ground up meal uh, over here they actually are okay. used for hunting and we have millions of the things because they have this very interesting trick of not only being able to have a, a baby in the in the pouch, but they have one in reserve. So if the baby in the pouch gets out, they're already in the womb on the way to the next one. We don't know how they do it because they get pregnant and they just keep the baby there until the season is right. Uh, I suggest this might be a good idea for women, but the women have held me down on that one so far. <laughs> Continual reproduction is a, is a thing which is pretty unique to uh, to kangaroos in Australia. So for those of you who feel really sorry for poor old Kanga the kangaroo uh, and in you know, a lack of numbers in the drought, whenever the grass comes, whenever the rain comes, boom, we are we are back to zillions of kangaroos. So uh, a good practical joke for the USA where they love Australia and don't understand much about it at all. But we love you over there in the USA. You can have all the kangaroos that you wish. Okay, apart from that. It's wet again down under, 
So we've got quite a few places being flooded. And I'm praising the Lord that Jurassic Ark rebuilt according to our 2011 flood design is still high and dry and making fabulous discoveries. Uh, we're also probably two thirds of the way through preparing our Easter conventions talks, as you and I have been talking, Joseph, and yeah. Diane and I have been talking too. So uh, I've got nine talks coming up on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday at a bush Easter, probably something absolutely unique to Australia. Bring your own sleeping bag, bring your own tent, bring your own dog, bring your own food uh, uh, and enjoy Easter in the bush. Don't bring your Easter eggs, they'll melt. Uh, there's, there's nowhere to keep them unless you bring your freezer as well. Uh, so, so that's Easter in the bush coming up. If you want more details on that, go and have a look online at creationresearch.net and catch our um, our promotion there of all the topics that, that we're going to be doing. Okay, now the last, last thing, uh, courtesy of Vance Nelson, you know, our, our U.S., uh, sorry, don't call him U.S., Canadian. Okay, he won't uh, get Greg grumpy at that. No, I'll get, I'll get <laughs> undrawn and quartered when I visit Canada next. Um, has we, We've helped, helped Vance and Vance has helped us for many, many years. And this just arrived last week. I mean, oh, this week. Look at that. It's lovely. a section of a pipe that has actually come from a hot water springs near Santa Rosa in California. And I'll get a bit closer. And can you see the crystals inside? These turn out to be crystals of calcite, calcium carbonate. You know, the same sort of things that hang down in the caves. The stalactites are made of calcium carbonate. So what you find is the theory that says this stuff takes ages to a deposit turns out to be absolutely provably wrong because this pipe has to be cleaned out every six months. And so we made arrangements with the owner to actually get a few specimens of this and shipped all the way to Australia. The shipping probably cost more than the pipe, really. But this one here, if you wanted the pipe to keep functioning, coming off the hot springs, letting the hot water out, and the crystals of calcium carbonate precipitating, you had to clean it every six months or it would choke up. So you don't need millions of years to go one inch of stalactite. Six months is all you'd need, uh, as in our pipe situation there. So that's a new acquisition for our museum. So if you're in Australia and now it's starting slowly to open, that's why I can go to Victoria, starting slowly to open. That's why I can see my kids, some of whom I haven't seen in almost two years because of COVID. Um, it, 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 it's a great opportunity to see Jurassic Ark if you ever get here. And for those of you Aussies who are down in Victoria, if I can come and see you, you can come and see us. And Diane, you're coming up here shortly, I believe. Yes, fairly soon, a few weeks' time. Uh, it will. Be, I haven't been able to see Jurassic Ark for, for quite a while either since last year, so I'm very much looking forward to that. So what are you going to be doing up here? Uh, well, well, we'll keep going with these programs because we can do them from uh, either end. Um, <laughs> We'll, <laughs> we'll go up to Jurassic Ark and uh, we'll keep going with our research that, that we're doing and our, our writing. So that, that's good. Yes. Okay. What, one, one thing I'll get in advance because next week you may or may not see me. I have a big group at mm. Jurassic Ark on the Saturday and uh, we're going to try, aren't we, Joseph? Hint, hint, Joseph. We're going to try broadcasting live from Jurassic Ark in the morning before the crowd gets there and take you on a... a you know, a, a, a real life, real time in situ visit so you can see some of this world famous museum and some of the latest discoveries at Jurassic Ark. Then again, if the internet's down or there's a concrete cloud in the way, yeah, uh, we, you may not see me at all, but we'll do our best. Yeah, well, certainly, certainly will. And uh, John, you'll be away as well for a week or two. And we've got some interesting stuff going on over Easter. But we've got some uh, people that we're hoping to get lined up to come on and discuss some of our USA people, which will be great. Um, so yeah, exciting stuff coming up. Carry on keep getting your questions in. Carry on, um, you know, uh, engaging and asking questions and watching and sharing and liking and all of the above. Uh, a quick reminder of what we've got going on over here in the UK before we have a look at a fossil or two. 
A reminder, we've got, whoops, that's the wrong, uh, I mean, yeah, we've got, uh, that's still. We're on a podcast, there you go. (laughs) We are on a podcast, but there we are. Uh, We've got this coming up, the Rocks Cry Out UK Fossil Convention. We're actually getting our first bookings for it. We do have limited spaces available, um, and we're continuing to add to the speaker um, number, uh, or the number of speakers, rather, for for the evening seminars and you get to come out and dig up fossils all day and workshops and have a great time as well as bible studies and devotions and seminars it's going to be an absolutely fantastic uh, week so uh, all the details are now up online tickets are live go and grab them while you can uh, because they as i say there are a limited amount of them so do make sure that you get up to date with that. We're also working on a number of other things, and it's been a, a very, very, uh, very busy week uh, for us. There's so much stuff going on behind the scenes, and it seems like in the last four weeks, everything's just sort of uh, all uh, hit us like a, a very fast and very large train. So keep the ministry in prayer, particularly the museum's project here in the UK, both for the collection and for getting it all on display and doing everything with it. So uh, it, it looks likely that we we will need a lot of volunteers at some point soon to give us a big hand with lots of different stuff. So get in touch if you're able to volunteer or want to support or want to help in any way that you can. And John, I'm sure that you'll be grateful of volunteers over at Jurassic Ark as well. We certainly will. And uh, if you get our email news mail outs, which we sent out last week, uh, you'll find a mention there of the, the museum in Canada too. Uh, so get online, have a, have a virtual tour online of Martin Legamati's museum. And you'll also notice there's a a message in there about our USA new worker, Glenn Wilson, Dr. Mm -hmm. Glenn Wilson. And he's basically starting up uh, at the end. Well, I guess it is the end of this week now. So have a look at Glenn's itinerary, particularly radio broadcasts from Central USA and uh, from Tennessee, where he hopes to make another Jurassic Ark outdoor museum right in the coal fields where he can dig up as many trees as he likes, fossil ones, that is. Hey man, yeah, no, great stuff. All right, fossils. You'll see we've got a few skulls here. Uh, we've spoken about these skulls once or twice before. And uh, John, in a minute, you're going to show us your full collection of skulls because we've got a few interesting ones here. Like uh, this is, excuse me, this is uh, Lucy, Australia Pithecus afrahensis. We've got the uh, Homo sapien var Neanderthal skull because they're not Homo Neanderthal anymore. Uh, they are regarded as human beings, which is wonderful. So we've got all our uh, wonderful skulls. But our fossil feature of today is actually this little thing here. Uh, I don't know if you can see what it is, see if we can get it into focus. It's actually a little sea urchin. Let's hold it up to the camera like that, see if it see if it focuses at all. You try it's to put really your hand really, behind it, maybe. It's not, really, it's not really wanting to focus in the slightest, is it? But there we go. We'll see. It's just a very big glare coming from that. Anyway, let's hold it back a bit so you can get a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of a look at it. Um, it's a sea urchin. It's a fossil sea urchin. This one in particular is preserved in flint. Uh, you can see some of the details on the bottom. That's better. That's nice and clear. Uh, it's got these wonderful ridges along the side of it where the spines would be. It's uh, a really nice specimen. And in particular, the reason I wanted to show you this is for a number of reasons. Number one. It's a living fossil, so this is somewhere in the region of 60 to 65, uh, sorry, 65 to 70 million years old, supposedly, uh, and yet they are identical to the ones still alive today. So living fossils, no evolution there. Secondly, this is also known uh, rather interestingly as a pound stone. The reason why is that they're all so uniform in weight and uniform in size that they were actually used as, as weights in the past. You'd use them to weigh your flour or your sugar or whatever uh, because they're so uniform in weight, which is a brilliant design. Also, this particular one came from a place called West Runton on the Norfolk coast. I used to live in Norfolk. Uh, I was born and raised there wonderful fossils from the Norfolk coast out of the chalk. However, Norfolk is quite unique because of the amount of glacial deposits that you get there too. And in this particular location, what you've actually got is chalk, which is regarded as the older rock by secular geologists. It's regarded as a flood rock by the majority of flood geologists. And this supposedly older flood rock is actually shoved on top of the regarded as younger ice age deposits 
And of course, that does make you wonder, could you even get a, a system or a way of uh, looking at the geological column and drawing a line saying, well, this is flood and that's not? Because it certainly can't be done by what goes up in order, because here we have something that's not in order in the slightest. It also raises questions about the way that rocks form. It raises questions about the way that layers form. It also raises questions about the geological column itself. And in fact, John and I like to call it the geological column because it really doesn't make sense in the slightest. It really is illogical. Now, this is a topic that we will be discussing on Standing for Truth, our good friend over in the in Canada, um, will be uh, on his channel on, well, we were just discussing this just before <laughs> before the broadcast. It's Monday and Tuesday if you live in the UK or the USA. It's Tuesday and Wednesday if you live in Australia. But either way, it'll be broadcast on Standing for Truth. You can go and find the uh, scheduled broadcast there. All the information is up there. We're dealing with flood layers. We're dealing with sedimentation. We're dealing with the history of geology and we're dealing with the geological column. We're actually looking to see, could you even get a line uh, of pre or post flood or pre flood, flood rocks, post flood? Could you just simply get a big marker and draw a line in the geological column? Or do you need to have a much greater and deeper understanding of the way that rocks actually form and the way that the world actually works? So that's a rather interesting thing that we're going to be dealing with in the next couple of days. So go and check that out and uh, get ready to show that. John, do you want to give us a bit more of a deeper introduction to the topic tonight and also uh, some of your wonderful skull fossils you've got over there? All right, well, I'll just continue a bit on with what you said, Joseph, because I went along your uh, coast at Norfolk with you, remember, collecting mm -hmm. echinoderms and other fossils and have a look at that oh, overlaying chalk and, and uh, stuff mm -hmm. that's there in the wrong direction, the wrong order. I think we, we and, found a giant sponge there as well in the in the flint, if I remember correctly. Uh, what's it was this a, week? A great well, well okay. I think week, you, you, you found a giant. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, <laughs> of course. The, yeah, so, and, and the thing that struck out to me about that day, it was a lovely day in the morning. So I went out with a pair of shorts on and uh, it was warm up till about 10 a.m. or so. And then the wind blew from Russia. And it reminded me of one little excerpt that I did on our climate change program because a similar sort of thing happened in the 1700s. And it reports that many thousands of British sailors actually died uh, on the ships because the wind changed so quickly and it brought a super freezing wind from Russia. And uh, so on that day, I started out in shorts and T-shirt. By the time we got to lunch, I'm rugged up like crazy. Uh, and the snow and sleet is starting to fall down. I thought, man, this is real climate change uh, from summer to winter, all in a matter of a couple of hours. So... Climate change is real. It's just not caused by you or I at all. And the, the fact is, it's been a phenomena for ages. The death rate of the British sailors on their ships when that big change occurred back in the 1600s, 1700s, really is a reminder. It's all happened before. As the Bible says, there is nothing new under the sun. Now, down to today's topics, I've got a, a couple of friends of mine. Um, I guess not too many of you have chimpanzee skulls. Um, I haven't worked in a zoo, but I do like to collect things and particularly casts of things. So I love to take this into the school classrooms uh, when we're allowed back. COVID has made big changes in who's allowed in schools or not. But there's our chimpanzee. And most of the kids, they're not too, too slow at recognizing these things. And they all like to see their late dead Uncle Fred and uh, find out this one's got his you know, with his top cut off, you can undo him and have a look inside him. And all of these, of course, we have a scientifically accurate cast. So you can actually measure their brain capacities and Diane's going to attach on that. And of course, I'm going to be taking you through quite a few of the skulls and uh, dealing with similarities and differences. Oh, they, it's a one way conversation between these two. And you will notice there's a difference in size and the shape of the face. And we'll do more and more of those as we also touch on things like, um, you know, the Oslopithecus that Joseph held up. So we're going to be dealing with all of that. I've got a portion to do first up. Uh, then we'll hand over to Diane, then back to me, a few questions in between. So perhaps if we bring up my uh, PowerPoints, Joseph, it's probably a good time to start that. 
Hey, that's me again. Where, where's my first PowerPoint? We, we clicked think, at the same time, Joe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we are. There we are. Coordinated disactivity. And again, remember <laughs> Sam's design there, which we've taken and added a, a uh, rainbow fluorescent type uh, CD structure behind it. Uh, that's our new logo, creationresearch.net. So again, if you want to find out the details of Easter, the discussion of the importance of being made in God's image and being remade in the likeness of Christ, that, that that's a great weekend, nine sessions from Friday through to Sunday of Monday, plus a field trip. Okay, our aim in creation research, and make no apologies for it, is that I was giving a lecture in the University of England, and one of the guys who'd come to Christ through our ministry, who was now a tutor there, said, here's your aim, that people may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this, the Holy One of Israel has created it. So no, we do not worry too much whether Facebook loves us or hates us. I just got a message saying we've been um, displaced off Facebook, apparently for some offense. I don't know what it is today, but uh, that's our aim and Facebook can love it or leave it. And uh, it, it, it's something we make no apologies for. We want you to know that the hand of the Lord, not just any Lord, the hand of the Lord God, not just any God, but he's the Holy One of Israel. He's the one who created it. So anything else you want to know about today's program, you can go to creationresearch.net, click on the fact file. Diane's responsible for that. Uh, and you'll find we have some wonderful stuff there about apes and man, chimpanzee, etc. Okay, IQ test in our first section. Human being. I mean, there's a pretty girl's face. Um, here's a guy's face. What do you notice is common between these? There's a young child. There's a slightly older child. There's a boy child. Can you see anything? Do you realize that monkeys can't cry? Or they can, they can just show distress, but they cannot cry tears. Now, Diane might want to comment on why that is later on, but in reality, when we follow up Joseph's comment of today, we're going to look at differences. You never read in your school textbooks that human beings can cry and monkeys can't. Oh, yes, we can both mourn, but we, we cry. They don't. Okay, today's topic deals with the fact that no gorilla is reading this. No, mon monkey can read that. They're not even sending in questions to Sam. They're not even watching Sam, no matter how good looking he is, or the fact that he's using his new computer so we can see him again. In fact, we've often made the point that no gorilla can read that. You see, the starting point of the Bible is that in the beginning, God created. No apologies. And it's not just any God. It's the Lord God of Israel, who became the Lord Christ, who descended to Israel. Ah, one God, three persons. Let us make man. Do you realize now why this is us? It's us in the Hebrew. It's plural. Let us make man in our image. So God created man in his own image, male and female. He created them. Now, the importance of this is that you and I can do one thing. I get sick and tired of debating skeptics who say, oh, you Christians don't think. You don't do real science. Well, if you want to be God's detectives, you need to take advantage of several things that God has instructed. I mean, God said to the people of Israel through the prop, through the leader of Israel, come now, let us reason together. And he said, you will love me with your mind. He told Moses that. Now, today we're going to do that and we're going to be God's detectives and try and figure out what the evidence is that we were made in God's image. And we're going to investigate just a few of these. What would the evidence be? Because some of you out there are skeptics and saying, it's impossible to believe we were made in God's image. Surely the evidence of the monkeys and the apes and the gorillas, etc. And then you go to museums and you see that man is just another ape. And not one place where you see these discussions do you ever say, what would the evidence be if man alone was made in God's image? Or you will see skeletons of humans you realize there are some museums where the human skeletons are really in the minority i mean look at all those skulls behind all designed to show you how similar we are and almost none of them concentrates on how different we are so let's try and find out 
both are similar and how different we are. Yes, you love going to the zoo because let's be honest, you'd like to poke fun and say, that reminds me of my little brother. It becomes a joke. Your little brother gets it, but the orangutan doesn't. So I visited this guy in a zoo and I decided I'm going to take some pictures. I stood there for hours. Oh, look, his eyes are shut. His mouth is going up and down with white stuff in it. And he was poking his tongue out through this white stuff. Well, what was it? I don't know how he learned to do this, but someone had apparently thrown some bubble gum in. Yes, you know, the, the gum the Americans love to poke their tongue out and blow big bubbles until it bursts and gets up their nose? Um, well, this guy could blow bubbles with bubble gum. And some of you can't do that. But it's a thing that humans and monkeys and apes and gorillas can do. Oh, and yes, isn't he cute? Just like your baby brother or your baby sister. And there, there's no doubt about it. There are similarities, but your school textbooks, your David Attenborough's, your BBC programs, your National Geographic's concentrate almost exclusively on how similar we are and not how different. I mean, look, they both got pink faces. No, he, he, he's not our closest cousin these days. Uh, he's got some differences too. I mean, can you actually look into the whites of his eyes? You realize you've never asked that question before? You can see the whites of the eyes in the human, even though they've both got pink faces, the human's got eyes that have got whites in it. Okay, can you see the difference now? See how dark and somber and evil the old ape looks like, the old gorilla looks like. In fact, none of these are listed anymore as our closest relatives. Not even these little ones who are so active and so they almost look like they're intelligent as they run around and play games. The number of the ape-like creatures or uh, monkey-like creatures has been reduced and reduced to those who seem to have some similarities that are more important than others. I mean, human evidence, fossil evidence, monkey evidence, it's, it's all been reduced to the chimpanzee as our closest living relatives. None others even come anywhere near if you only consider similarities. Now, again, to make the point, this chimpanzee, this gorilla ape-like chimpanzee is not watching this program. He's not reading a high school textbook on how similar we are. Now, he certainly doesn't know that we're different. I mean, did you know that? Apes, monkeys, etc., have sialic acid on their cells, which is not found on human cells. Some of you are old enough to remember the baby Fay experiment. Now, the scientists knew before they took that heart, uh, the monkey heart, and put it, or chimpanzee heart, rather, and transferred it to the baby, that she didn't have a chance because that sialic acid, just one molecule, is enough to kill you. The similarities and differences, both of them matter. Oh, yes, I've visited so many skeleton museums looking for similarities and differences, but you can find them in the museums, in the zoos, even in the textbooks if you look hard enough. Now, this is from the zoo down in Sydney. And, and I, I'll be honest, quite a few of the people who are on board there are not exactly in love with creation research because they want us to think that we are made in the likeness of the apes. We are not made in the image of God originally. In fact, the time I was there, the zoo had a display on at the chimpanzee cage, pointing out one difference. That's so vital. Can you see the human foot in the middle top? Can you see the chimpanzee foot on the right hand side? Do you realize that the chimpanzee, its foot and its hands are similar and the human foot and hands are different? I mean, when I first went to the British Natural History Museum a long time ago, they had this guy on display. Do you notice the hands? Do you notice the feet? They're actually pretty close. In fact, both of them have fingers and thumbs. I mean, that they have they have hands for feet. In fact, that's why they can hang upside down in a tree. When you have a look at these guys, which end would you shake hands with? Perhaps if you're a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you might want to know. But the fact that they've got four hands and you've got two hands, it's a simple difference, but
but it's why you can't hang upside down holding onto a branch with your toes because toes are actually functionally different and they are for different reasons but it also produces one consequence you see our mate the gorilla here now if your mum when you were young saw you playing in the yard crawling along looking like that she'd rush you off to the hospital straight away and they'd deal with you for curvature of the spine you would be in a serious sorry state now do you notice the length of his arms do you notice the length of his feet in in addition uh, their arms go right down to their past their hips wow and, and and in fact what you find is this produces another effect as well see where his head is i mean look strip the skin off have a look at his head the head is actually hanging off the end of the skeleton now that also produces a consequence and it's one reason why the chimpanzees and the gorillas and the apes and orangutans can't even watch this program and make sense of it i mean look there he is he's looking at us see his long arms you can't see his hands there four hands that is remember because when you've got four <laughs> hands your head hangs off the end of your skeleton therefore unless you have curvature of the spine you can't balance the weight of your head against the weight of your skull and the, against the weight of your body that is so you can't have a straight backbone therefore you have a problem you see the back of the skull is full of muscles to hold your head up because if you didn't hold it up you'd bump into every tree but if you have to have such huge muscles you can't have much room for brain space now a lot of consequences follow from that so your brain i will talk a bit about brain space shortly you've got 1200 or so cubic centimeters the old apes and gorillas are down to the 400 they don't even have room for sort of the cognizance that you have listening to this program Oh, yes, you've heard about their cousins, the bonobo, uh, the pygmy chimps standing upright and walking. You've seen the little sequences in every high school course where they play you this locomotion in bonobos. See, it walks along. Uh, see, it then starts to stand up and it looks like a human. And then it, um, well, it goes down again. In fact, if you have a look at this, what you find if you read the full program is the chimpanzee, the, the, the pygmy chimp, he can't stand up that long vertically much at all. Yes, he can do it. And he does it particularly in water, where the water's holding his weight. But he is a, well, let's see what the textbooks say about him. He's a habit, habitual quadruped. They also engage in bipedal locomotion. So question, how much time do you spend walking around on all fours? I mean, let's be honest, by the time you get to one, you're already up on your feet and you'll stay that way unless somebody knocks you over or like me you're crawling through a cave trying to get through this very narrow uh, little access but bonobos they're habitual quadrupeds and i'll guarantee your teacher didn't tell you that hmm okay remember the challenge that i made the bible says study to show yourself approved it says search out all things it says test everything Okay, you are not being unscientific if you say, what would the test be that man was made in God's image? And not just spiritually, because God is a spirit. So one of the evidence should be that man would have a spiritual aspect. As far as we know, there's no first church of bonobo science. They, they don't go to church. They don't have a religious structure that we can uh, discern. But if you're looking physically, socially, mentally, the things that are much easier to deal with than matters of the spirit, what would the differences be? Well, we haven't got time to deal with all of them, but we do have a key difference. Key difference, that's the one that the similarities are far outweighed by the differences. This one alone is all you really need. I mean, here's evolution, right? The chimpanzee standing upright to the man. Now, let's be blunt. There's never been any evidence of that at all. We've got chimpanzees. We've got humans. We've got a bunch of skulls. Diane's going to compare some of these skulls in a little while so you can add some more data to it. This is evolution, a good picture. This changes evolution from nature to nurture, from a big bang that brought things into existence when nothing had, had occurred, 
molecules to microbes to monsters to men. You are not made in the image of God. You're made in the image of, well, hydrogen, I guess. But where did it come from? What's it made by? Well, all by chance, all by change. Whereas the biblical picture says the real history of change is from God who created us in his image. We did not happen by ourselves. But then sin came in and that thing the theologians call the fall. Not a, a very popular discussion today, but the reason for the war in Ukraine is that man is a sinner. Sadly, the verse that Je Joseph talks about, and he'll come back to that, mentions that when Adam had kids, they were made in his likeness. Yep, you heard me right. Adam was made in the likeness of God, in the image of God. But when sin came in, from then on, all of us are born with a defaced image. Sin is a real problem. It causes war. It causes murder. It even causes the animals to fight one another. So the one major difference is this one. Have you ever asked this question? Why do we speak? And monkeys don't. Let's stop fooling ourselves. You can teach monkeys sign language. They don't teach to each other. You can even teach them to respond to your verbal commands. But then my dog does it better than the monkeys usually do. Why do we speak and the monkeys don't? Well, it's there in that Bible verse. God said, do you realize that we were made in the image of a God who speaks? Not just a God who's a stone idol, but a God who could not only create, but he spoke. God said, let us, the Trinity, the triunity, let us make God in our image. If you're going to be made in the image of God, then have a think about what image means. Go and stand in front of a mirror and talk to yourself. Have you noticed you can talk, but your image, the image in the mirror, the lips move? I guess if you could be, be a, a, a lip reader, you could figure out what it meant. But when you speak, sound comes out. When your image speaks, uh, the lips move. When God speaks, universes appear. You see, one reason we can speak is a made in the image of God, who is the speaking God. And not only that, the reason you might want to rush out and make a cup of coffee and the monkey won't, the reason you want to rush out and cut yourself a slice of bread that you made, mum made, or the baker made, is anyone who's made in God's image has one other characteristic. Not only do we speak, we can create. Oh, nowhere near the scale of God, but we can even make miniature planets. It's called the International Space Station. We've even had Russians on that recently. Isn't that great? Better than them fighting down on Russia versus Ukraine. Let us make man in our image. So the evidences that you look for, the fact that man can do the things that God can do mm -hmm. and the monkeys can't. Man just won't do them as well as God did them and he'll do them even less efficiently because man is no longer totally in the mm -hmm. image of God. Sin is a problem and we're made in the image of Adam's fallen son. Well, you want to see more of those, I'll get them to uh, flick my screen up there. Just leave that creationresearch.net Q&A in the side of the screen as a, as a reference. And I'm going to remind you before Diane takes over that if you've enjoyed what we've done, but you haven't seen this before, pull me back full screen, Sam, please. Okay. You can see all of that and more on our uh, streaming uh, of the DVD, Monkeys Don't Cry. And in some of the offices, we still have some old DVD copies left. So if you are a DVD addict, or you want to go and give it to your friends. Monkeys Don't Cry is a full program and you'll see all that plus more. Or if you want it for the kids, try that one. Adam and Eve and the monkeys in the trees. Do you realize monkeys don't rhyme? John Mackay does, right? Um, so we turned this into a little book for kids because it's so important that they understand right from the beginning that they were made with a heritage in the image of God. And if they want to know why, they get so mad at their brother and sister and then they scratch each other eyeballs out. They turn their toys upside down. They plot on how to disobey mum and dad. It's the fact that the image is defaced by the sin that Adam brought onto the planet. Now, Diane, I believe you're going to uh, um, take us now in some interesting stuff on the differences in brain capacity, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, yes, we're going to have a look at um, so-called primitive human beings because the, the picture is that we're on the way up, but in fact the, uh, 
the reality is the opposite. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, start by going to the British Natural History Museum, if we can have the uh, slides there, Joseph. Um, there we go, that should be up. And just a reminder to everybody as well that... Um, if you've got any questions, make sure you stick them in the chat. You know the drill, mm. stick a cue and add the question. We'll be doing a question-answer session after Diane's section before it goes back to John and comes on to me. So keep those questions coming. Yes, yes. Well, um, this is a photo I took uh, visiting the uh, British Natural History Museum quite a few years ago. As far as I know, that display is still there. Uh, is that right, Joseph? I, I believe so, yeah. I last visited, it would have been about six mm. months ago, and that was still yeah, there. Yes. Um, yeah, no, nothing much been updated. It's still pretty much in the same condition as when you would have seen it a few years back. So. <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, this is one of their big feature displays. It's quite close to the uh, to the front entrance. And uh, one of the first things you see when you go to this display is the sort of the great wall of human evolution with all of these um, names, this plethora of names of various homos and australopithecines and things like that. And uh, all of these casts of skulls and we have some similar casts uh, some of these we don't have this entire collection um, now i do have to give them credit when they have put these on display they have showed where the actual finds are and where they have had to interpret um, the uh, the gaps as it were because you never find entire skulls and that's important to remember you never find entire skeletons either in fact you really find sort of whole bones there uh, they tend to be broken up and they have to be put together and so what they've done with some of these is where they've um, assumed that these fragments all come from the one skull and there are a lot of gaps they've shown where the gaps are now that's being honest and so if you study this, you can see there are awful lot of, an awful lot of gaps and there are bits that don't even exist, um, like the, the, the one at the top there on, on the left that doesn't have any jawbone and uh, doesn't have uh, much in the way of a top either. Um, the one called Homo nalidi, uh, they've assembled that from two, two pieces and filled in the bit in the middle uh, with on the basis of certain assumptions. However, this is the take home message that most people have of um, where we came from. Chimpanzee somehow changing step by step into uh, upright uh, human beings. Now, no evolutionist says that we believe that we evolved from the living chimpanzees, that they mean an ape-like ancestor. So this is the idea that most people have in their mind from the secular uh, TV uh, or uh, um, programs these days or from their own schoolwork. We start with the ape-like ancestor and then through a whole series of uh, hominid ancestors, we come to archaic human beings until we get to modern human beings, scientific classification, homo sapiens, which means wise man. And uh, there is a, a lesson to be learnt there if you look at what the Bible says about uh, people who call themselves wise, calling themselves wise, they became fools. So we need to be very careful there with, with that classification. It does act as a warning. So keep that in mind. So let's have a look at some of these so-called archaic human beings that we are supposed to have evolved from. And... Uh, here are a couple that are well known. One is Cro-Magnon and one is Neanderthal. And uh, we have the uh, John Hild up a, a couple of those skulls that we've got. They are museum quality cast. They're not the originals. The originals are extremely fragile and they're kept in um, the sort of the, the backs of museums and uh, very rarely see the light of day because they are very fragile. But they have made these um, very good scientific models, and you can uh, you can buy these. All right, Cro-Magnon man. Uh, Cro-Magnon is not an official scientific terminology. It just refers to the fact that these uh, skulls were originally found in a large cave. So these are the original cavemen. 
Now, our normal picture of cavemen is sort of, you know, Ugg the caveman who is sort of brutish idiot and was uh, just slowly turning his grunts into grammar. Uh, not at all very sophisticated at all. However, there's been some interesting study on uh, so-called cavemen, and one of them we've reported in our newsletter. You might like to, to look this up. It's about caveman art. Now, you've probably seen some of the wonderful pictures of the, the art that they've found in some of these caves. It's just absolutely brilliant. And so some scientists decided they would do a study of these um, animals, which are very cleverly depicted on the, um, the cave walls, and have a look at how realistically the cavemen have portrayed the actual movement in terms of um, if you have a moving quadruped, uh, you've got to work out sort of where the legs are in the different cycles within the stride. And it's not easy to do. And so they looked at the cave art and they compared it with a whole lot of pictures from so-called modern Western art, from modern European art. And uh, they came up with this conclusion. And this is the actual title of their study, which they published in this journal, PLOS1, uh, which is an online journal. So you can access this uh, for free. Cavemen were better at depicting quadruped walking than modern artists. And then their subtitle is Erroneous Walking Illustrations in the fine arts, now notice they called it the fine arts from prehistory, so from cavemen uh, era in their mindset, in their evolutionary timetable to today. And in fact, those cavemen, those cave drawings really are fine arts. Um, and it wasn't until we had modern photography in the, in the late 1880s um, that uh, artists were able to get really accurate pictures of the... Um, of the, uh, how the legs move uh, with one another uh, in the cycle of, of a quadruped st um, stride, you know, like a galloping horse or something like that. So do have a look at that, uh, that study. It's in, it's in our fact file. And this was their conclusion. Cavemen were more keenly aware of the slow emotion of their prey animals and illustrated quadruped walking walk more precisely than later artists. So there's nothing, nothing stupid or primitive about cavemen. They are extremely sophisticated. And in the uh, professional literature and professional science, people recognize that. But we still have the uh, popular picture of Ugg the caveman who's a brutish idiot. All right, let's move on to Neanderthals. Um, they get a lot of publicity and there's been a lot of research into them over the last few years as well. Uh, and it's proving very, very interesting. Now, this is the uh, one of the casts that we have. And he certainly looks like he's pretty battered and had a long, hard life. And that's certainly true, but uh, that he has had a long, hard life. But there's nothing primitive about it. Um, the term Neanderthal actually refers to a place. It doesn't mean primitive, even though it's come to mean that in modern parlance. It's a place uh, in Europe, in Germany, actually, and it refers to the Neander Valley. Now, the Neander Valley was named after this man, Joachim Neander, who was a Bible-believing Christian, and he wrote some wonderful hymns, and he was a poet, and he used to uh, walk in this valley, and so it became named after him. Uh, and uh, one of the hymns he wrote was actually about creation. So uh, he's, um, he certainly believed that uh, the Lord God created everything, including human beings. And so if we go back to uh, our uh, rather battered looking Neanderthal skull, yes, it is a rather odd shape. The um, the, the cranium, the upper part of it, looks a bit different to uh, a modern human skull. And this is the sort of early reconstruction that uh, you would get from uh, when they originally found these, and we're going back into the 19th century. And so he was usually portrayed as this rather brutish-looking idiot, all bent over. Now, part of the reason for that was 
when they found some of the original bones, they were badly affected by um, bone pathology, by uh, bone diseases, arthritis, and uh, possibly uh, rickets from a poor diet. And some of these bones were given to, or casts of them were given to this man, Rudolf Birkhoff, who, who was really the, the founder of modern pathology. That's the modern scientific uh, study of disease. And he looked at them and he declared Neanderthal man to be a pathological specimen. In other words, a, a disease specimen, perhaps of relatively recent origin. Now, he lived around about the same time as Charles Darwin, but he didn't believe in evolution. So he believed that these bones were just ordinary bones of people, but people who had suffered from, uh, from a long, hard life and from bone diseases. Now, more bones of these were found. They've been found all over Europe. And uh, in, in 1912, there was um, an almost whole skeleton found uh, in, in a place in France. And again, they reconstructed it with a sort of upright but slightly bent over, slightly bent uh, appearance. And so you would get these comparisons here, like in this old illustration, skeletons of Neanderthal man and Homo sapiens, as if they were different species. And for a long time, they were classified as different species. Now, the skeleton, the bent over skeleton, um, that is just... Uh, but biomechanically impossible in, in the long term. That just will not work at all. Human beings are designed to stand upright without having to contract uh, our muscles, our bones are neatly balanced again against the line of gravity that goes uh, through, through our spine, through the hip joint and the knee joint and literally holds them up straight um, by gravity and ligaments. Uh, alone with hardly any muscle movement at all. But that bent over thing with even that small bend in the hips and the knees and the uh, the forward uh, bending of the, of the head there compared with the pelvis, that's just biomechanically completely unstable. It, it just would not work at all. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, they have done more research on these. Now, these days we can take scans of... Um, uh, fossil bones, and we can reconstruct them uh, together to see how they would function. So they've done this with these uh, Neanderthal bones. And uh, a recent study, again, which we have published the details of in, in our fact file, um, this uh, scientist from the University of Zurich said, well, on the whole, there is hardly any evidence that would point to Neanderthals having fundamentally different anatomy. In other words, their anatomy is our anatomy. Um, you just have to take into account that, yes, they did suffer from bone diseases, but so do we. And uh, so now, at least in the museums, they have Neanderthal man standing fully upright. And this is from that display in the British Natural History Museum. However, they still haven't got it right because notice he's not wearing any clothes. And I'm only showing the top half because the bottom half is also unclothed. And that is not right in terms of what we now know about Neanderthals, right? This same scientist who did that study on the spine said it is therefore time to move beyond making Neanderthals less human and focus on subtle shifts in late Pleistocene human biology. Now, again, that's part of the evolutionary timetable, that, that term late Pleistocene. Um, but what he's saying, we have to look at Neanderthals from the point of view of being human beings um, and we can learn from their behavior in this, in the uh, time that they lived, however you like to classify it. So we'll, we'll let them look at that. Uh, all right, we've got lots of studies on their biology and on their behavior. Now, we can't look at them behaving. We can't go back into history any more than we can go and look at the Romans behaving and things like that. We have to take the... Um, uh, the, the evidence that we have got and reconstruct it. Well, we can do that with Neanderthals. 
And there's interesting research. Uh, this is just a, a couple of things. Their jaws functioned like modern human jaws. So there's no reason why they couldn't eat and speak and uh, do all of the other things that we do with our jaws. But really interestingly is that their hands were capable of what's called a precision grip. So they can scan in all of the hand bones, put them together and see how they would work. And sure enough, their hands were capable of that very precise grip that you need for manipulating tools and for writing and drawing. And they have found some of their tools, tools and they're smart. And that's um, that's their term, the, um, the, the, uh, the scientists who study these things. Right. And Neanderthals were also considered to be the first artists. Now, again, they're putting things into an evolutionary timetable, but they have looked at the cave art that's in caves where Neanderthal bones have been found. And again, we wrote up this, uh, this study in our fact file and sent it out in our newsletter, so you can look that up. They were intelligent, skilled hunters because there's evidence that they were able to hunt mammoths. Now, you can't just go out and do that on your own. Um, and mammoths lived in cold weather, so you can't go out uh, without any clothes on like the man in the, uh, the British Museum and go hunting a mammoth. You have to be intelligent and skilled and work together and communicate. So, again, we have a picture of intelligent, sophisticated people who work together and live in community and to achieve certain um, important uh, results. And they were able, so you put all of that together and this is a more modern uh, uh, picture of them in a European museum. Notice they have actually got some clothes on him and, uh, and he's manipulating some tools with the... Uh, um, animal that he has caught for both food and for making clothes, for making furs. Now, another interesting thing is that um, the research in their living spaces showed that they used fire, they cooked food, including grains, vegetables and herbs. So they ate their greens. They didn't just live on um, the uh, mammoths that they hunted. Their, their living spaces were organised into sleeping places and cooking places. And very interestingly, we can, uh, they have extracted DNA from some of these bones and they've found genes that also exist. Now, that's not whole gene, it's gene variants um, that uh, are found in living human beings. And one of them is particularly interesting. Notice the colour of the eyes that they've given this model. Right, they're blue. They've found uh, the blue-eyed gene, and there's evidence that uh, some of them had fair skin and red hair. Same sort of variation that we have in modern human beings. Right. So in the end, right, Neanderthals are us. And uh, this was uh, a, a quote from uh, one of the numerous studies that's been on uh, that's been done on on Neanderthals. To be Neanderthal is a distinct way of being human. By understanding Neanderthals, we enlarge the meaning of hum humanity. In other words, Neanderthals are part of the human race, the uh, human species. Uh, there's nothing different about them. And as Joseph said, they are now uh, in the professional literature, they are classified uh, as being fully human. Uh, as being the same as us. But people still have this idea that somehow they are primitive and human beings are evolving upwards. Uh, and they still uh, um, think of, well, we're getting better and cleverer. Well, if you read the news these days, you, there's not much evidence for that. Um, but this is an interesting point that was made by Steve Jones uh, quite quite a while ago. Uh, when he was interviewed uh, about um, the whole issue, is human evolution over? Because he once uh, stated, well, you know, we've come to the end of human evolution. And he was asked this question uh, by the interviewer who started off by saying, well, I think there's some evidence that we already have bigger brains than we used to have. Again, notice the assumption. We used to be chimpanzees. Now we're not. So the interviewer went on, not at least when you look at chimpanzees, is that not a direction you know that in the future 
we will have bigger brains still. So is that is that, that what we've got to look forward to? Bigger brains. We're not like those primitive human beings um, who lived in caves. Well, as we've said, living in a cave is not so stupid and not uh, and uh, there are evidence in the cave shows how sophisticated they were all right well let's put that to the test and steve jones was quite honest about this to be frank with you i don't think so the odd thing is we certainly have bigger brains than chimpanzees now that's very true in fact we have more than three times the size of brain of chimpanzee but we have smaller brains than neanderthals now, remember the Neanderthal skull is uh, certainly a, uh, uh, looks a bit different to this modern human skull. So let's uh, do a bit of a brain size test. Now, these days we can scan uh, living brains and we can actually work out very precise volume, uh, but you can't do that with a skull that doesn't have a brain in it. But we can get an idea of how big the possible brain was by looking at the space inside. And uh, so you can measure the volume or the cranial capacity. That's how much space there is for the brain to fit in. And if you do that for a present day human, you get an average of, of sort of around 1,350. Now there's a bit of a range there of a couple of hundred mils on, on either side. So let's go to the Neanderthal skull. And again, it does look like uh, it's a bit battered and misshapen, but it's certainly not smaller. It has a, a capacity that's a, another 100 mils larger. So Steve Jones was right. Neanderthal does have a bigger brain than the modern human average. And so if we convert that to sort of a volume of water, we've got that illustrated there next to it. Um, now, the, cave, the original caveman is actually even bigger than that. <laughs> around 1,600 mils. So instead of evolving bigger brains, as the BBC interviewer was hoping, sadly, we are undergoing a brain drain. And uh, we're not evolving upwards. And in fact, this is how we should think of cavemen, Neanderthal men, those who lived under difficult conditions in the past, this is how they should be portrayed and this is how they are portrayed in, in a modern German uh, museum. Now, notice the properly constructed clothes, complete with decora little decorations there. Uh, notice him crafting a wooden object using that precision grip that you need to be able to hold and manipulate a tool. These were intelligent, sophisticated people who did live a tough life under difficult uh, circumstances, but they were fully human and probably smarter than us because I don't know that I could survive in the conditions that they lived in, but these people certainly did. And uh, if we could just end the slideshow now, there, Joseph, and come back to us. Uh, human beings have changed, but we are definitely not evolving. Diane, I'll throw in a, a comment before we throw it open to questions. That um, model of the human mm. being, the white one, the Neanderthal with the staff, I took yes. that picture in the Neander Valley Museum and yes. it reminds me of mm. two things. Even the German area where he was originally found is acknowledging he was human, he was bigger than us brain-wise, he was very skilled and had no trouble behaving as a certified human being and definitely mm. a white one with blue eyes in some cases but it struck me as i was going through in the, mm. the neander valley in germany that the history of the name itself is also fascinating because neanderthal uh, the tal mm. bit means valley uh, as in yes. dale as in english or vale uh, so mm. neanderthal neander's valley is named after a famous hymn writer joachim neander whose most famous hymn is still in most church hymn books, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. So the name mm -hmm. itself, Neanderthal, is probably, even though they, they, they chose it for a Darwinian reason, it actually points back to man being made in God's image. And even after the flood, they were still better, stronger, smarter, and uh, bigger than us. So good, yes. good points there. Uh, Joseph, over to you to organise the question time. And then... Um, I'll go back to my one last section on skulls before you and Diane sort of 
round off the day. Absolutely. Sounds good. Um, all right, Sam, how are we doing with questions and the like um, down here? I see if we've had a few come through. You're on, uh, you're on mute, Sam. We can't hear you. So I'll have a look through and see what I can find. Um, I know you are. You're not on mute, apparently, according to this, but we can't hear you. We still can't hear you. No. Never mind. Are you good at sign language, Joe? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'll um, I'll let you try and fix the sound, Sam. While we have a quick dig through some of these uh, some of these questions and see what's come up. Um, here's a question from uh, Shelley. Why is it assumed that just because their bones were found in caves, they must also have lived in caves? Uh, any comments, John or um, Diane? John, you and I have been down many caves in our in our time, but. Uh, any, any comments on that? Well, mostly what I've found down there is bones of animals that have fallen through holes. So whether it's kangaroos or giant dipratodonts or more recently a dingo uh, fossilised um, yeah. in the dry stuff down there, there's a simple answer to um, that, and that is that some of the bones we find in caves are associated in the ground of the cave. So you go in... Uh, and there'll be several feet of deposits on the bottom of the cave, uh, sometimes overlaid by bat poo. So it's got a pretty sterile environment in there. Bat poo is not the, uh, uh, the nicest stuff to deal with, but it certainly insulates anything that was put in that dirt before the cave uh, was, was sort of got to its present stage. But you'll find that many of those caves have continued to be lived in, right? So that they've been lived into right up till recently, and then some anthropologist or biologist gets the idea, let's excavate the cave dirt. And in that cave dirt, they'll find old fires, they'll find fossils, they'll find human bones, bits and pieces, along with the remains of all their cave-style meals, right? So uh, there's many evidences that indicates that if you find the bones in a cave, uh, then they actually belong to people who lived in the cave. You do need to be reminded that just because you're a caveman doesn't mean you're a primitive man. And I say that because when I go to the USA, our office in the USA is in Tennessee, and the first settlement in Tennessee, think of the history. People left England largely, or Germany, or Europe in general, and they sailed on what then were the fanciest, modern, most technological wooden ships in the 1600s, 1700s. They arrived in the USA they arrived to a wilderness. The local natives may have had teepees, they may have built wooden palisades around their thing, but the Europeans had nothing. So the first place they set it, they got over the plateau in the eastern part of Tennessee, down into the Tennessee valleys, and you can still see where they chose to live first. No houses, no city, no stores, nothing built that they were used to. So they lived in the caves, along the banks of the river just outside of Nashville. And so we know their history. They wrote it down and, and we've looked at it and they weren't cavemen and primitives. They were advanced people and they lived in the caves simply because it was the smartest place to live in the absence of anything else. Great stuff. Thanks for that, John. Here's a question for Diane, perhaps, um, from Will Jenkins. Are you back, Sam? Can you hear us? We can't hear you. <laughs> I'm assuming, uh, John and Diane, you can't hear Sam. No. 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 How's that? No. Can you hear me now? Oh, there we go. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. I, I think Restream just decided to just go, no, nope, like nope, nope, yeah. no, I don't, I don't like you anymore. It's because you laptop. <laughs> That's what it is. Um, Will Jenkins, from which one of Noah's sons would have would these Neanderthals had have come? Well, Neanderthals are mainly found in Europe. The, the, uh, the original ones were found in Germany, but they've now been found um, all the way from Spain or back to the Middle East. So if you go to the Bible and look at uh, where the descendants of um, Noah's three sons moved, uh, the ones that moved into, um, into Europe were the, uh, the descendants of Japheth um, and that fits with um, with their distribution. So they were probably 
uh, one of the descendants of Japheth, mm -hmm. uh, who, um, whose descendants moved into various parts of Europe. Mm. Great stuff. Great stuff. Thanks for that, mm. Diane. Um, how are you doing, Sam? Any other questions come through or anything? You've gone again. You've gone again. <laughs> Oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> right, how's that? Well, and you're back. Well, that's okay. better. Right, yeah. okay, right. Oh, Lord, give me strength, please. Okay, um, <laughs> so my chat has disappeared. I can't see any more questions. Fair enough. No worries. Um, I'll go through it. Uh, right. Let's have a quick look and see. Um, I think we've got one more question come through from Neil, which is, how many modern men could design a boomerang? <laughs> Well, well I I've, teach... I've flown on several, and I know you have, John. So yeah, that's true. Well, I, I love to use it, and if you've been on our web, creationresearch.net, gone to the shop on any of our creation research sites around the globe, you can access uh, via streaming a program called Search for the Origin of Life, which myself and Diane put together many years ago, and part of that produces a new program uh, called uh, what, what's the one on creation, Diane? Um, the one where we do the stand, the final proof, right? So you final go to the final proof, proof yes. you can stream it. It's a great session at Griffith University and the boomerang features as an evidence of brilliant design. And I love to use it in classrooms. We've even used it on our program here where we give the students a boomerang and ask them to make one, right? Now, most of them can copy the shape, but their boomerang never comes back. And I have to remind them that not only is that a famous song invented by an Englishman, my boomerang won't come back, but it's also a evidence that they didn't observe as carefully as they could because one end of the boomerang is flat and like, a, like an aeroplane wing, but the other's got a little aerofoil on it. So if you put that in it, it will then spin around and come back. If you don't, you may as well just call it a stick and throw it and send the dog to get it. Uh, so the boomerang is brilliant evidence of design, but you'll find that most people today, given by themselves, could not only not design a boomerang, they could not even figure out how to light a fire. But it's not an example of lack of IQ, it's an example of lack of absolute training in having to survive and use their brains. So you'll find that most people in the end, if they needed to, probably could. But many people have no experience whatsoever in the wild, in the woods, they don't even know, do you use a root, a branch, or the or the tree to actually make a boomerang? So uh, go to our website, go to streaming, have a look at Search for the Origin of Life, get some great IDU teachers out there, or go to the one we did at Griffith University called Creation, the Final Proof, and keep watching for new programs. Diane, mm -hmm. any comments? Right. Yes, there are a, a lot of things that are s supposedly primitive that actually take a lot of sophisticated, clever engineering or clever design uh, to do. And uh, that they found that particularly in these Neanderthal sites that they've found um, that, that quote, smart, sophisticated tools, that comes out of the professional literature. This is well known in the professional literature. It just hasn't got out into the popular, uh, into the popular media. Great stuff. All right. Well, for our, our next session, we'll leave the questions there. Keep your questions coming if there's anything else. For the next session, we'll hand, uh, is it back to you, John? For the, Yes, you can uh, hand back to me. Yeah. I'll do Great one stuff. section dealing with uh, the most famous one. So if you want to switch my uh, screen on again, please, Sam or Joe, whoever's in charge of that, you will notice that uh, I did this slide here. I mean, I've used this analogy before. It didn't happen by itself. Even the text didn't happen by itself. I am the creator of that word ape man on this screen anyway. I didn't invent the word, but the word didn't invent itself. And the word did not type itself onto this picture. This is a created design and I am the creator, which is how I know who did it. But you live in a world in which people are told, well, here is the evidence we come from ape men. Uh, Lucy, Australopithecus, still in the textbooks despite the fact that it's so out of date, it's not funny. And in this museum display, do you notice that Lucy is mostly spaced out? They're the bits that we actually found. And I still remember seeing the program where Dr. Johansson introduced his discovery on TV. And uh, at that stage, it was a filled in skull. And it was hilarious when the interviewer found the bits we had 
were hardly worth even knowing about. But nevertheless, there is Lucy, named after the Beatles song they were playing uh, in the mind of the uh, discoverer, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, LSD, and what people have done with it is a good illustration of that. But is Lucy an ape or a human being? Let's have a look. Apes have large jaws and small brains. That's why they're in the zoos and you've got to watch them. They have rectangular or V-shaped jaws. Human beings, remember our whole aim at the start? Test everything. Only look up the evidence. Look, check the facts that are true, both in the Bible. Don't believe something is in the Bible unless you go and find it yourself. Humans have small jaws, large brains, vertical profiles. Now, I went to school with a guy who sadly suffered an affliction where his jawbone didn't stop growing like most of yours does. It just kept on growing and everybody regarded him as abnormal, which he was. Humans have U-shaped jaws. In fact, if you then, courtesy of our Canberra Natural History display down there at the university many, many years ago, they had a display comparing Lucy's skull, the chimpanzee skulls, the fossil human skulls uh, compared to a human. Now, do you notice the letter U in the human skull? Notice the letter V in the fossil ape skull? It's that easy to tell the difference. That's simple. You don't need much education to see that they're very different. In fact, there's Lucy's one. Now, notice the distinct V shape. Now, that's even evident in the jaws you see today in the museums. But see, it's not the shape of the jaws that is used to distinguish between Lucy and human beings. Everybody knows Lucy's got an ape-like jaw. They just don't talk about it. Everybody knows Lucy doesn't have a human-like jaw. But here's a more significant difference. Now, this is what's in the textbooks as evidence we must be related to Lucy and her cousins. It's to do with our hip area, with our pelvic area, with the section where our legs meet up with our hip bones. Now, do you realize that with humans and apes, remember we made the point that the ape-like creatures, if they stand upright, they don't last very long, whether it's bonobo or the big gorillas, they get back down on their four legs and they're perpetual quadruped uh, walkers. You and I stand upright. Now, if you're going to have hips that takes an upright leg bone, then the angle at which that, see, see the hole in the middle right bottom there? That's where the top of the leg bone joins uh, your pelvis. You will find that you have to have a different angle if you stand upright than if you are going to be a quadruped. Ah, when I watched this program on Nova back in 1994, ages ago, Dr. Donald Johansson said Lucy's hip was like a chimp's hip. Now, the interesting thing is, as I watched this program and I deliberately went, made a copy and filed it because I'd never seen this in print before. Um, question, if you found a creature and the jaw was like a chimpanzee and now you admit that the hip is like a chimpanzee, you remember the old statement? If it quacks like a duck, if it waddles like a duck, then it is a duck. You find a chimpanzee jaw and a chimpanzee hip, what have you found? Well, you see, the interesting thing on that program, and I've still got a copy, and you can access a copy on Nova, I'm sure, today somewhere. He wrote on Dr. Lovejoy, who still explains the problem. And then he went and he remedied the problem. Oh, the problem was when Lucy died, she fell into a swamp, and she was basically compressed until all of these hip things became abnormal to uh, her normal upright stance. And then he remedied the problem. You saw him do it on screen. He took Lucy's hip and he reshaped the socket where the leg uh, joined on until it became a miniature human hip. Now, when I looked at that, myself and my team viewer, Larry, at the time, could not believe that you could do this on television as a scientific evidence and then think you would get away with it. But they did. And because evolution is so popular, not popular because it's true, popular because it enables you to disobey God and justify being gay. It enables you to disobey God and justify murder, abortion. It enables you to do all of that. That's why they got away with it. But sadly, that reconstructed, it's actually a creation. Um, they recreated the hip. They changed the evidence. 
And that's what you can buy from the Carnegie Collection. I bought that from a big museum in the USA. Wow. Lucy standing upright, looking like Mother Mary holding baby Jesus. Done deliberately. It's so emotive. But that's what teachers see and use. And when they hear me coming in or Diane or Sam or Joseph, then they say, you people don't even know what the evidence is. Yes, we know what the evidence is. You only know what the evidence has been, been, been changed into. You know the lie. And they think they know the truth. And the Bible is full of statements about when men believe a lie, what a sad consequence it actually is. Okay, what do I do? Well, I love taking those into classrooms. See my chimpanzee skull on the left there? See Lucy on the right? Yep, that's the full reconstruction. The kids are amazed when they discover how little we actually found of Lucy. But I actually put them on the front desk, hold them up and say, what's this one on the left? And they remember from the start of the lesson where we talk all about chimpanzees, that's a chimpanzee. Now, so far, I have not had one school, one classroom, one teacher. I mean, let's be honest, most of them have never seen a full cast in hand that they can actually touch. And their first reaction is, if the one on the left is a chimpanzee, the one on the right is a bigger chimpanzee. And I'm pretty sure that what we find is that chimpanzees have basically gone downhill. They don't have as big of range as they used to. They're not as tall as they used to. And the kids need to know the world's real history is going from good to bad to worse. From creation of man, as well as monkeys, from the creation of man in God's image. And then that sad comment in Genesis chapter 5 that Adam had children made in his image. But at that stage, he was a sinner. And that leads up to the whole of the importance of the gospel. And Diane's going to talk a little bit now before Joseph finishes off. Diane's going to deal with what happens if you're a Christian and you actually run with the concept of God using evolution. So if you'll cut me off, Sam, and put Diane on, that would be great. <clears throat> yes. Uh, yes, that's um, that's the the last slide from the um, from what I spoke about before. Human beings have certainly changed, but we are not evolving. So if we can just go back to us, um, because a question that we commonly get from churches, even evangelical churches, uh, is that well, does it really matter if we believe uh, in human evolution, in ape to people evolution? Uh, couldn't God have just stamped his image on some of these um, supposed hominids? Now, as you've seen from what we've shown you today, uh, the evidence for these supposed uh, intermediates um, is uh, pretty flimsy. And uh, so the science doesn't match up to it either. But it certainly doesn't work if you try and uh, squeeze it into the Bible. And as John said, we, we are told to... Um, to test everything. So if someone does challenge you like that, um, right, pick up that idea and say, all right, well, let's look at that in the light of what scripture actually says. So for a start, this story of uh, apes turning into people just flatly contradicts the Bible. The Bible is quite clear that the first human beings were made completely separate from the animals. There's never been any connection between us and any animals. And remember, a chimpanzee is actually a large and dangerous wild animal. They're not the cute ones that you see in Hollywood movies. Uh, those are usually juveniles that have been bred and brought up in captivity, and they are amenable to um, human teaching. But when they grow up, uh, they become a large and dangerous wild animal. But we were never, ever connected with the animals. Read Genesis 1, it very clearly tells you, or Genesis 2, actually, um, Adam was made from raw materials, right, dust of the ground. Eve was made from tissue taken from Adam. They were new creations made by God, no connection with human beings. So there is just a flat contradiction, and there is a, a modern trend to say, oh, well, do we really have to choose between evolution and uh and creation as 
as we would teach it from uh, uh, in creation research? Yes, you do. If there are flat contradictions, we do have to make a choice. But God's word will stand up to any honest scrutiny. So, so don't be afraid, right? Choose God's word, but learn and think. So let's try and think it through. Uh, another clear contribution, uh, contradiction rather. Uh, the creation was complete after the first human beings was made, were made, and it was declared to be very good. But according to evolution, it was death, disease and struggle, things that are not very good, that actually produced human beings. We are the end result of these millions of years of uh, Darwin's war of nature. That's not very good. But when God finished the, the creation complete with human beings, it was very good. So again, there's a flat contradiction and we can stand our ground. But let's look at this idea of God stamping his image on um, supposed hominids. There are some really interesting um, problems that that brings up. Um, what happened when God stamped his image, if, if, that's, what he, if that's what he did? Uh, they would have had to have changed in some way. Were they miraculously healed of all of the mutations that they would have inherited from the millions of years of evolution? Because if one couple um, were going to become the uh, parents of the of the human race, they're going to have to breed, uh, well, amongst themselves, but then their immediate descendants are going to have to breed amongst themselves uh, and as Adam and Eve did. But remember, Adam and Eve started out perfect. These hominids would have had a whole lot of mutations and they couldn't uh, breed that closely after the first few generations. And in fact, that's why close family marriages are banned in most, uh, most societies these days. Uh, well, what if God stamped his image on a group of hominids uh, and they could still breed with the, with the other hominids? Well, what was the spiritual status of the, uh, of the possible offspring? So you get these sort of um, spurious, strange questions, but you know, put things to the test and see what the logical outcome is. And you'll see the word of God is internally consistent. It stands up to any honest scrutiny. So don't be afraid to defend it. Uh, now, another interesting question is, well, where did Homo divinus live if, if that's what happened? Remember, Adam and Eve lived in this beautiful, fruitful garden where everything was very good. And it wasn't just the Garden of Eden that was very good. The entire world was very good. So uh, the story gets sillier and sillier if you actually put it to the test. So don't let anyone just use throwaway lines like that. Go and examine what the Bible actually says. So know what scripture says and don't be afraid to check out the science as we've done in today's program with, with these skulls, with these actual specimens, with these actual studies. Uh, but really the most serious problem, of course, is that theistic evolution, the idea that God took animals and somehow turned them into people, it breaks the link between sin and death and salvation. Because if we are the product of millions of years of death, disease and struggle, uh, and then uh, God says to Adam and Eve, well, uh, if you disobey me, you will die. Uh, and it's very, and the world was very good then. Um, that, that is another clear and flat contradiction. The world was very good means it had no death, disease and struggle in it. So we are not the product of those things. Those things are in the world now because they are the result of sin. And that is why Jesus had to come to die and, and die a real uh, physical, um, spiritual and mental death. You know, his whole, whole being died just like human beings die. And so it breaks that, um, that link between the coming of sin the coming of death, the coming of death, disease, struggle, all of those things that are the result of human beings disobeying God. And if you want to uh, take it even further than that, one day the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come again and he is going to make a new heavens and a new earth. Now, that earth will have no death, no 
mourning no pain. It will be very good as well. Now, when God declared the world to be very good in the first place, if it was full of death, disease and struggle, can we trust him to keep it out of the new heavens and the new earth, which is also going to be full of, um, which is also going to be very good, full of the goodness of God. Uh, so we need to remind ourselves the scripture is entirely consistent and internally consistent and logical. If you try and introduce a man-made theory into it, it does start to become illogical and it does turn people off. So don't be afraid to uh, defend the story of the origins of human beings. Know what scripture says and don't be afraid to check out the science as we, we've done uh, today. And you can follow that up in our fact file. And remember, um, <clears throat> death came into the world because of human sin. The good news is, and we'll be looking at this fairly, fairly soon, with uh, Good Friday and Resurrection Day coming up, one man, Adam, may have brought sin and death into the world, but one man, Jesus, came to die and bring new life into the world. And it all fits as a complete, internally consistent story from beginning to end, and we can stand our ground against any human-made theories. Uh, so if we can go back to uh, us, if there are any further questions on, on that issue as well. Uh, I'd, I'd do Joseph now. Joseph, yeah. if you want to get your one, then we'll take the yes. final question. Yes. I think that's a good idea. Let's dive into right. my short right. section uh, and give you a little bit about that, and then we will finish right. up with any questions. A quick thing, by the way, for all of you who are believers out there watching today, a personal request from me. Could you all please pray for my younger sister? Her name mm. is Esther. She's 17 years old. And yesterday she came out covered in bruises all over. She got taken into hospital. And one of the big concerns, because her uh, her platelet count, and Diane will, can explain more about what platelets are, but it's essentially mm. the stuff that makes your blood clot, right? Her platelet count is basically zero. Um, they're concerned that it could be a number of different things, including leukemia. So we'd really, really appreciate mm. uh, some prayer for that um going uh, going mm. on because obviously it's got uh, uh big implications and the foul family is obviously very very worried about it so uh, any prayer mm. for her or for the family is greatly mm. appreciated so my little section let's pull up my uh, my powerpoints here if it all works now this is a uh, a talk which i've given a number of times actually this is a, a little end part of a talk this is a talk that uh, is all about animal rights futile in their speculations is the title we go all the way through the whole concept of animal rights from beginning to end it's a very long um uh, segment uh, and it's very popular particularly with farmers and people who are christians and involved in animals in some way and we deal with logic like this don't kill mosquitoes let them take blood donation urge, urges french animal rights activists i wonder how many people watching tonight would be happy to actually take this activist up on his idea um giving a mosquito a blood donation so we have good fun going through all of this it's a great program we probably ought to do it for creation conversations at some point and this is the kind of thing that we make uh, this is the point that we make over and over again who said this beware of false signs it leads you astray the answer is paul to timothy in 1 timothy chapter 6 verse 20. Oh, this is our sort of creation research summary of the whole chapter, essentially. Read through the chapter. It's a great chapter, but it does use, if you pick up your old King James Bible and open it up, it does use the word science there. Science so falsely called. Simple reason, science is the old Greek word for knowledge. Beware of false knowledge, beware of false science, and Paul's warning to Timothy is that it will lead you astray. Of course, the flip reverse to that is that true science will point you towards Christ. So we need to be wary of false science. We need to make sure we have a way of identifying true science as we move on forward. Here's the program uh, that I would do with, I mean, it's a huge topic. It's a controversial topic. We don't have time to go through all of it on you know, the best of nights. We certainly don't have 
time to go through it in the next 15 minutes or so. What we're going to be focusing on is a few points down animal intelligence because it actually ties in quite nicely with what we've been talking about today i mean i mentioned earlier and john has reiterated it everywhere you look when you're looking for evidence of human evolution you're looking at the similarities between apes and human beings and sometimes those similarities are valid sometimes those similarities are not quite so valid but also you need to pay attention to the differences that's what we're looking at tonight particularly we're looking at animal intelligence image of god or the image of an ape what about things like emotions or love is there a difference between intelligence as we understand it versus just basic cognitive thinking ability can monkeys actually you know use sign language again this is a big topic we're not going to get it all get through it all tonight but what we are going to do is have a look at a case study Oh, by the way, if you want to know why I'm sort of semi-qualified to actually talk about this, uh, my background in academia is predominantly geology, and we're pursuing that, um, uh, uh, the work in geology, particularly in um, uh, biochemistry, but looking at paleobiochemistry, so the biochemistry of fossils. But I did work for six years as a zookeeper, and I ended up funding a, another qualification in zoology, actually specifically dealing with animals and zookeeping and how to create enclosures. You can see we're creating an enclosure for a Burmese python there and all sorts of different stuff. I spent six years playing around with animals, getting up close and personal to them, um, and even some of your Australian animals as well. Um, this was actually when I visited Australia and I got up close and personal to one of your cuddly koala bears. Uh, this is a wild one, by the way, even though he's sitting on a guy's settee, <laughs> he wasn't very well. And so uh, Mark, the guy we were staying with, actually brought him inside and uh, gave him some food and let him get nice and warm. So I do know a thing or two about these animals, and I've worked with them, like I say, for six years and continue to work with animals uh, on a personal basis, and uh, I know a thing or two about how they work, how they act, and how you can also train them. This is the case study we're going to be looking at today to get a bigger perspective, Coco. Now, Coco was quite a famous gorilla, uh, and the, the media portrayed her as a gorilla that had learned over a thousand signals of American Sign Language. The media portrayed her, and in fact, the Gorilla Foundation that really owned her um, portrayed the story that she regularly talked to keepers. Uh, he, she met very several famous um, celebrities, including, I believe, the late Rob, Robin Williams. Uh, the portrayal is that she conveyed emotions and messages to keepers and she also gave perhaps most famously a final message to the public before her death there is Coco the gorilla in a studio setup ah, studio setup is a key word there because let's actually have a look about what Coco is and uh, what she did. She's a Western Lowlands gorilla. She lived from 1971 to 2018, and she hit the media in late 2018, early 2019, with a final message for humans. Now, the video was taken by her zookeepers from the Gorilla Foundation Park, right? What was her final video message? Well, this is what she portrayed through sign language. I am gorilla. I am flowers, animals. I am nature. Man, Coco love, Earth, Coco love, but man, stupid, stupid, Coco, sorry, Coco, cry, time, hurry, fix Earth, help Earth, hurry, protect Earth, nature, see you, thank you. Now, two things that you need to get into perspective here. First of all, something that can help is if you know a thing or two about the way that film actually works and the way that film gets edited together. Because one thing for certain, this film was heavily edited. You can go and Google it. It's free online on YouTube and the like. The film was heavily edited in the sense that it was lots and lots and lots of clips. Pretty much every single word was a separate clip um, intermingled with her you know, chewing on some food or something else. It also helps if you know a thing or two 
about positive reinforcement training and the way that animals are actually trained to do things. But let's actually have a look at what some other people said, uh, people who were involved in linguistics and language and also understanding the creation of language. Let's have a look at what they said about this Coco video. Professor Sherman Wilcox, Professor of Linguistics at the University of New Mexico. This is obviously a doctored video. I mean, there's no doubt about that at all. Composed of highly edited clips. Again, you watch the video. It's clip after clip after clip of single signs pieced together to look like Coco is actually saying something when she is not. I mean, this is somebody who really knows what they're talking about when it comes to the creation of language. Professor Graham Turner, Professor of Language at Harriet Watt University. Coco never learns sign language, he says. Sign language, or language rather, requires the creation of new patterns and sequences for any context that may arise in a situation. Not just following a keeper, uh, what a keeper is doing, in return for a reward. To claim that she, Coco, had a message for humans is rubbish. I put rubbish in this because this was in an interview with him and he used uh, slightly harsher language, shall we say. Uh, but the idea, the idea was pretty much the same. The keepers had a publicity stunt to show that is it. Hmm. Okay, two things out of here. What's this comment that he's making about language requiring the creation of new patterns and sequences for any context that may arise in a situation. Now, tonight, we're having a Q&A session, just after my segment, right? Now, here, I'm looking at my computer, right? This screen that you can see, Professor Graham Turner, is taking up my entire screen. I have no idea of the questions that are floating in. So when I finish this segment, I'm going to have to go over to the Commons and see what kind of questions come in. And I have to take that information in to my brain. I have to understand the information that has been presented to me. I have to be able to relate it back to something that I've already said. I then have to be able to formulate an answer to that question based on what I've already said, based on what the question actually says, the actual content of the question, and also knowledge that I've learned in the past and have to piece it together in a way uh, to make a sentence that I've probably never said before in my life. I have to adapt very quickly to create language, to create a creation of something brand new that I've never had to say, for, uh, say before in my life and actually give it to you in an understandable way, in a way that you can actually understand the words that I'm saying. This is the creation of language, and it's something that appears to be unique to human beings. Animals just simply don't do it. But what about this point he made here? Not just following what a keeper is doing in return for a reward. What is he talking about here? He's talking about something called positive reinforcement training. It's something that we use with most of our animals. Uh, there are a few animals, well, some animals actually uh, can react really, really well to positive reinforcement training, uh, like a dog, for instance. Some animals, like a cat, don't do as well, but you can still do it. Goats react brilliantly, sheep don't, even though uh, most creationists believe they're the same created kind. It's amazing how stupid a sheep is compared to how intelligent and clever a goat is, right? Um, even things like snakes and they've even done tests with fish, uh, the fish that are supposedly only have a two second or a five second memory, right? They've done tests with positive reinforcement training, and it seems to tap in to a specific instinct in most animals. Positive reinforcement training reinforces certain behavior with positive rewards. That's literally all that it means. You are reinforcing certain behavior patterns based on something that is positive or something that the animal finds positive. It is completely dependent upon the trainer and actually has no implications on the animal's intelligence. Uh, certainly not in the creation of new language or new cognitive parts. Some animals seem to be better at responding to positive things than not, but that purely seems to come down to the instinct of the animal. All you are actually doing is expanding on the already existing ability of an animal to understand positives and act accordingly, right? So when you get your dog, uh, one way of positive uh, reinforcement training is using a dog clicker, right? And so when your dog does something, you have to basically give him a click and give him a treat. Now, what he's doing is two things. He's recognizing what he's 
heard essentially uh, the click with what he's eaten and so when you tell him to do something or when you get him to do something or when he does something that you want him to do you give him a click which he automatically responds with uh, ah that was something good because he automatically associates that with a trait and that's just one example of the many different ways that you can do positive reinforcement but you are essentially uh, working with that inbuilt um uh, already inbuilt kind of um, way of thinking that the animal already has, that kind of ability to see something positive and actually respond to it in the correct way. Right? Oh, I'm going to go back to that tree because that gives lots of bananas. I'm not going to go to that tree over there because it doesn't. As a wild example. It's the opposite, by the way, of neg negative reinforcement training, which is you give it a smack when it doesn't do, when it does something you don't want it to do. Um, generally speaking, positive reinforcement training is regarded as the better technique by most zookeepers and zoologists today. So you'll have nothing to do with animal intelligence, really. You're basically expanding on an already existing ability that an animal has to see a positive and continue to do it. What was going on here with Coco then? Well, it's quite simple. What they don't show you is the zookeepers behind prompting Coco to do a sign language and actually give her a treat when she does it. Question, was Coco actually piecing those words together? Was Coco actually creating intelligent thought and speaking a language? No, she wasn't. The zookeepers were doing that behind the camera and was actually making her say something in a sense they were manipulating her to say something based on what she already knew. Now, there's no doubt about it. Coco did know some signs and could actually respond accordingly. She could ask for a banana, for instance, or she could ask for some fruit. But is that language? No, that's Coco knowing, again, positive reinforcement training. It's Coco knowing that if she makes a certain sign, she will get food as a result. If she makes a certain sign, she will be allowed outside of her enclosure to go and wander around outside. She knows that if she's doing a certain sign, she gets something positive out of it or gets something negative out of it. It's not actually putting together cognitive language. So... Did Co could Coco have intelligence with speech and communication ability? No. Did she have basic animal thinking ability, cognitive thinking ability, complemented by positive reinforcement training, which, by the way, is intelligence from a human being implemented on an animal? Yes, she did. All right, finishing with a warning. It's because, well, what was Coco's message? You're destroying the earth. Um, make sure you save it. Uh, climate change gets in everywhere, right? Even in Gorilla's final messages. Um, worship the creature. Worship the creation rather than the creator. You've heard that somewhere before. It's from Romans chapter 1. A stark warning. They did not glorify God, says Paul. They did not thank God. They became futile in their speculations. Hey, that's the title of the whole animal rights talk in a general, right? Futile in their speculations, pointless, worthless, stupid in their thinking and ideas. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and they served the creature rather than the creator. A harsh warning to anybody who worships the creature rather than the creator, who puts the world that God has created above the one who actually created it. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. They exchanged the natural use of their bodies. They burned in homosexual lusts. They committed what is shameful. And in verse 32, such things are deserving of death. The point, those that worship the creature rather than the creator will be given up to evil. Those that worship the creature deserve to die. Ooh, harsh words, but they're not mine, I'm afraid. And they're not even really Paul's. These are straight out of the Bible. These are the word of God itself. Those that worship the creature deserve to to die. But before all of you people who don't worship the creature rather than the creator go, well, I'm so glad I'm not like those animal rights activists. Uh, yeah, don't fall into the same trap that the Pharisees did, because the Bible is emphatically clear that there is no one who does good. No, not one. That's in Romans chapter 3, verse 12. All have sinned and fallen short of the gl God's glory. Um, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. But... All who believe are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. 
This is what it's all about with creation research. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those who believe in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So make sure when you're talking to people about this, make sure when you're dealing with animal rights, make sure when you're dealing with apes or humans or you're conversing with people who uh, aren't believers in scripture or you're talking about climate change or animal rights or whatever it is, make sure you get this point through to them. Yes, you're a sinner because you worship the creature rather than the creator, but then so am I. We all need a saviour. And by the way, his name is Jesus Christ. Well, I'm going to finish it just there and uh, bring back to the others. And while I'm shutting it down, uh, maybe Sam would like to start having a look through some of the questions that we've caught up for you so far. Certainly can. Uh, good to see everyone here. Uh, got a, well, oh no, it's a joke from George. Uh, classic obviously it's april fool's day so jokes abound what do you call a boomerang that won't come back a tree Answer a stick a stick yeah there, you go. there we go um right okay so we do have a question here from iron matt uh, here we go uh, question do you think that lucy sediba and the like a juvenile extinct apes or uh chimera specimens or what instead of the missing link that, that they say you want to have a go at that one, Diane? Uh, well, Lucy is uh, the Australopithecus uh, afarensis that um, we, we've just looked at. Um, it, the original skeleton was in a whole lot of pieces, uh, but all of the pieces are ape-like. So, uh, and anyway, the term Australopithecus just means southern ape. So there. It, Again, in the professional literature, they understand that this creature was an ape and all the research that goes into it. Uh, so it's fully ape. Uh, the one called uh, Sediba, um, again, if you, the, the research into it shows that it's fully ape. Um, so it's, uh, it's a completely different kind. So uh, a I don't think that they are juveniles or that they're fully adults, um, most of these these ones that have been found. Um, I don't think they're juveniles or chimera specimens, meaning mixes of um, different, uh, different species. Now, that does happen. In fact, uh, someone did have a look at Lucy's spine and... Uh, looked at the individual vertebral bones. The spine was not found as a, a whole spine. It was individual vertebral bones which had been put together and they discovered that, well, maybe one of them was actually a baboon bone, which is a different kind of, um, uh, uh, well, it's actually a monkey rather than an ape. But um, so, uh, so, yes, some of them probably are chimera specimens because the human beings that were picking them up and putting them together have put together um, specimens from, from different species. Um, so uh, they, they certainly are not missing links. These are individual separate kinds. There's no indication that they were ever any different kind of ape or a monkey or anything else. Um, they're just uh, different kinds and some of them may have been mixed up. So the missing links, I'm afraid, are still missing. If uh, if uh, either John or Joseph want to add anything to that, no, I think you've done a great yeah. job there, particularly with the uh, comment that they're not juvenile. Uh, the evidence that I've seen would also go along with that. Even though Lucy is bigger than a modern chimp, she's simply probably an example, like you see in many cases. Neanderthal bigger brains than us, fossil chimpanzees bigger brains than the present day ones, and so you've got that devolution the word that Richard Dawkins hates, you know, because he wants everything to go upwards, uh, but it's actually on the way down. And even the fossil animals uh, indicate often that size degeneration as well. It's a simple factor and more environmentally determined as well as genetics, but it's a real evidence of devolution. Joe, any comments? No, I think that's covered. That's covered most of it. Um, yeah, I think pretty much I doubt that it's juvenile. All the evidence shows that they're probably uh, adult, um, fully formed, fully functioning apes. Yeah. That's about it. 
I just had a um, text come in. It's out of uh, one of the publications I subscribe to, published today. And uh, it's got this comment in it because it's on the nature of eggs and the nature of the philosophy of evolution. Charles Darwin ruined the chicken and egg paradox when the Greek philosopher Plutarch posed that question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I remember in high school and in primary school, we'd go round and round. I wasn't a Christian in those days. We'd go round and round and round arguing, had to be the chicken and no egg, but it had to be the egg or no chickens. Anyway, he was describing a situation in which cause and effect are, um, are, are unclear. Although Plutarch's question is metaphorical, evolutionary biology has provided a literal answer. The egg came first. Right, so at a simple level, it produces a stupid answer, evolution, but its big level is the fact that man did not come from human beings. He must have come from something else. In the case of the chicken, a reptile egg, where the reptile was born with a couple of bits that would become feathers. And man did not come from a human being or from God. He was the result of slow progressive change. So even at the stupid level of simple questions like that, evolution is out to change absolutely everything. And you Christians should have needed, listened carefully to what Diane said. You even dabble in God using evolution. You don't just destroy a story in Genesis you destroy everything up to the book of Revelation. That's why at our Easter convention coming up, and again, I encourage you, if you're in Victoria, come and join us. You do have to book, so get the details off our website. Mm -hmm. But our theme, a key theme that we've been discussing over the last few days is that verse, both in the New Testament, or several times in the New Testament, Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. God wasn't caught out by sin, and he certainly isn't impressed by evolutionary nonsense. Mm -hmm. He already had plan of salvation worked out before the creation was even worked. So join us for Easter. Join Joe for his uh, coming camp, fossil camp, up there in September. Joe, any other comments from you? Uh, let's just see if there's any final questions that have come through before we... Uh, uh, we've had a very nice um, thing from George, actually. Uh, it says here, creation conversation is the best and most comprehensive answers to questions you'll hear. Excellent. We'll put oh, that thank, the review, George. Uh, thank you, George. Can we quote <laughs> you on that, George? Yeah, we better do that and don't pay him a thing for it. It's great. But uh, <laughs> we're joining you, George, and uh, and uh, our, our mate over there in the USA next week. So, uh, Sam, what? Uh, sorry, Joseph, give him a reminder about when we'll be on um, the the uh, truth one. So yeah, I'm we got very to... confused about this just before we started. I've, I've got it up. If you need me to read it out, <laughs> now it, well, okay, it's, on, it it's on the fourth and the fifth, I believe, um, of April. It's at about eleven o'clock in the evening. If you live in the UK, which would make it around, that'd be around four five o'clock in the evening, depending on where you live in the States, or it's Tuesday and Wednesday if you live in Australia, sort of uh, early-ish in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning or something like that. So again, we're all over the world with it, so uh, it should be good. Remember, we've been asked to deal with the topic of where is the flood boundary? And uh, we've been asked to deal with this a few times, but of course, in order to really answer that question, you need to go much, much deeper into the whole theory of geology, the way that sediments form, the way that they form in the real world versus the way that uh, people believe they're formed in most geology today. You have to look at the history of geology in terms of where did the idea of deep time and the geological column actually come from and Steno and everything else. So we're going to have two whole sessions of a couple of hours each. Me and John will be going through a whole load of great content. So join us over on the Standing for Truth site, um, which is uh, in a couple of days' time. Uh, any One final question, Sam, or are we all out? Uh, yeah, we could do one final question. That's fine. Uh, we can do this one here. Uh, this is from Neil Grindley. Uh, when we question what God has said, where do we stop? We ask, did God really say? Sound familiar? Where did that come from? By all means, check God's word, word th uh, through. I think that says at the end. Very, okay. very good so point there, Neil. I'll give a simple comment and a reminder about our, our books and resources on that. When we ask that question, it is from Genesis, because if you want to summarize Satan's attempt to uh, bring man down, uh, he starts with challenging Eve and asking, did God really tell you not to touch this tree, right? Uh, not to eat from this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you think about it, 
Eve should have come up with one reaction. A talking snake? What what rights it got to challenge me and challenge my God? Be gone, you talking snake, right? Um, so that, that's how she should have reacted. Instead, she accepted the question and went and got her husband to join in the plot. So a very subtle undermining of God's authority because once you start asking, did God really say that, it doesn't stop until did God really say he's coming back again? Did he really say he's going to judge? To which the answer is, yes, he did. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild makes a great Sunday school song, but it needs to also include Jesus furious and wild over the issue of sin. And he is coming back to judge. So don't undermine the Bible with um, sort of suggestive questions like that. And again, overall, if you enjoyed what Diane said or Joe said or I said, don't miss our book, Walking with Jesus Through Genesis. We'll be following that for our Easter convention down in Victoria. You can get it from your office, Joseph, from our office, Absolutely. from the American office. You'll find that a wonderful uh, comment on Genesis and walking from the start with the Creator, who is none other than Jesus Christ. Great stuff. Yes, Thank you very much for that, John. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead, Diane. Yes. Uh, if you want some more details uh, about apes and people, we have a section on it in this book here, your questions uh, about creation answered. It comes from our, uh, our website, Ask John Mackay, where people send in questions. And we specifically deal with that one, well, what if um, God did stamp his image onto uh, supposed hominids? Is it all right for us to believe in uh, in evolution of apes to people? Can we fit that into the Bible? We deal with that question, plus general questions uh, about apes and people like those differences that we've mentioned. So um, have a look at that website or have a look at this book. There's a whole section on it. Great stuff. Thanks very much, John, Diane and Sam. Join us uh, next week. We're not entirely sure what we will be doing. There will certainly be some, uh, or Lord willing, there will certainly be some live videos coming from Jurassic Arc at some point. Um, if we can get everything over to John in time and everything's all set up. But how well it will work uh, linking him in live through Restream and so on. I've tried it before and it doesn't really work. So we'll see how we do. We may do a few test runs, but uh, we will be here again next week. The following week, we will be broadcasting Easter sermons, uh, which will probably be pre-recorded stuff. And uh, we may just get some, uh, we may get some uh, guests and stuff on in the next little while as well. So God bless everybody. Thank you very much. Catch you all next time. Any last words from the panel? Just goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. God bless. God bless. Yes. Goodbye. God bless. And we will see you next time. Catch you later.